Oh, so oh, there I'm nice and nice and loud and booming, which for those of you who know me know is uh, completely unnecessary. I'm always loud and booming, um, much to many people's chagrin. We are going to be talking about shade in here. If you are uh, here because the sign outside said something about IoT, um, uh, this is not uh, what we're going to talk about. You're still welcome. Uh, I'd love to talk to you about shade. It won't probably teach you anything about IoT. Um, uh, it may not teach you anything about anything, but, uh, but it definitely will not teach you anything about, about IoT. Uh, so um, uh, I, I don't know where that actual that, that talk is supposed to be. Um, so these talks are online, um, or these slides are online. Uh, if you want to get at the, the content, that's the URL. Uh, you can also Twitter me at that, uh, at that Twitter, with all the Twittering. Uh, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, that you can also grab the source code uh, at get.anogus.com. Uh, it's, the, it's the source code for my website. Uh, so you, you get the talks and also uh, you know, the rest of my personal website. Uh, so great, <laughs> good for you. I'm not sure exactly what you'll do with that, but uh, it's available. Uh, yay, open source. Uh, <laughs> uh, so go nuts uh, as, you, as you feel like doing um, or whatnot. Um, so uh, I, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I work for a company called Red Hat, uh, something with Linux. I'm not really sure you may have heard of them. Uh, we have a, a lovely, uh, lovely logo uh, there that it has a name that is Shadow Man. Um, uh, so we all, we all have to like him. Uh, I, I believe I have the appropriate amount of white space around the logo. There are guidelines for that, um, but I'm not a graphic designer, so I might have gotten that wrong. Uh, I work in the Office of Technology, um, uh, which is sort of like the Office of the CTO, but we don't have a CTO, so you can't really have an Office of the CTO, uh, so it's the Office of Technology. Um, uh, I work on a, a, a project called Zool, um, uh, doing uh, exciting things in the CI CD space, uh, and also closely associated with our fine friends in the Ansible organization. Uh, probably, if I probably you know, wouldn't have. They were, they were uh, you know, involved in getting me to Red Hat in the first place. So we like them, they're great, uh, uh, and all that type of stuff from an OpenStack context, because you know, hey, this is the OpenStack Summit. Uh, we're all OpenStacking all the time. Uh, I sit on the technical committee uh, of, uh, of OpenStack. Uh, I also am on the developer infrastructure core team. Uh, and and I, I realized, actually, uh, right at this moment, uh, there's a bug in these slides. Uh, I probably should list on the slide that I am the PTL of Shade. Uh, <laughs> given that's a thing and this is a talk about Shade, it's uh, possibly relevant. Uh, so you just have to get that from the audio version. Um, uh, that, is, uh, that is how that works. Um, so we're going to talk about a few things. I, I gave a talk yesterday uh, that you can't now attend because it was yesterday unless you can travel backwards in time. Uh, and if you can, please see me after the talk, because I'd really like to learn how to do that. Um, but I gave a talk yesterday uh, on like how to use Shade, so there's a bunch more like example-y type stuff. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit more about what it is, why it is, like the motivation. Uh, there, there will be some example-y stuff, but uh, hopefully more s focused on what's the problem uh, being solved and why we have a library and, and all of those sorts of things, um, uh, with some examples, because, you know, Talks about examples are boring, uh, uh, and uh, we, we will also get into some of the more advanced uh, things towards the end, uh, caching and, and the task management interface and, and a few other bits. Um, so that's that's a general overview. Uh, I will also warn you that I have a, a strong tendency to uh, to ramble and go over time. Um, I will, as always, attempt to not do that. I will almost certainly fail. Um, so sorry uh, in advance if, like yesterday, I go over by 20 minutes. Uh, but uh, I started late yesterday, so, so hopefully I'll only go over by like five. Um, so what is Shade? Shade is a Python library. Uh, it wraps business logic uh, around OpenStack resources and operations. Um, as a few design principles, it is to expose a single API that works on all the clouds. Um, I, as a cloud user, find it very frustrating when I have to know deployer uh, choices that were made um, and uh, have if conditions in my code uh, so that my code works differently on the different clouds. Um, it, uh, so it, it hides all of the vendor and deployer differences that it possibly can. Um, it is explicitly written to support multi-cloud. Uh, uh, so sort of write once, run anywhere, but I'd like to do that better than Java. 
Um, uh, it's hopefully simple to use. Um, say in defaults, I will talk about some things that you can do that are more complicated. Uh, it does not have plugins. There are no shade plugins. There never will be shade plugins. Uh, it, if, if there's an open stack service, it is welcome to add its code to shade. Um, uh, we have, you know, it turns out clouds have services, uh, and um, the, the, in general, uh, it, is, it is a fair thing to ask a user to do to, uh, to check to see if the service exists on a cloud. Uh, so at the service level, I'm, I'm kind of fine with that. Uh, that's fine. Uh, it is uh, provably efficient at scale. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, and we, we make some claims about the API always being backwards compatible. Um, as with every human endeavor, uh, humans make mistakes. It is our intent not to ever break the API. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm not perfect. Um, so, uh, but if we do break the Shades API uh, and, and it breaks you, please let us know. We will consider that a massive, massive, massive problem and we will fix it. Um, uh, it, is, it is not, breaking the API intentionally is, is not uh, okay and we, if we find the need to rename things or whatever, we'll just keep aliases in the code. Uh, that's, that's, uh, our cost to bear, it shouldn't be your cost. Um, uh, I actually should put another bullet point on here. Uh, I, I think it's encompassed in this, but, uh, but for what it's worth, it, is, it, it does not aim to, exp as you might be able to tell from that description, it does not intend to expose a good, uh, a, a sort of direct, well-crafted interface around the OpenStack REST API itself. Uh, if that is a thing that you're interested in, you should check out the OpenStack SDK. Uh, project, which, which is is a thing that is tied to the to exposing those APIs to you well, right? Like so, those are two different kind of kind of consumption models depending on what you're wanting. Uh, we we make some different choices than the OpenStack API does. Uh, if the open, there are times when the OpenStack API has a thing that's named something or or has a behavior, and we don't do that because we don't like it. Uh, that is a freedom that we've decided that we are free to do. Uh, so if that kind of mismatch with the published REST APIs bothers you, we are not the library for you, um, because uh, that is important to us. Um, so the source code is uh, in OpenStack's infrastructure, as you might imagine. Uh, you can also get it on PyPy. Um, uh, although I, I hear, uh, I, I'm still supposed to pronounce that either PyPI or Cheese Shop, but I can't get myself to do that. So uh, you can pip install it, and it should work pretty well. Uh, this is used behind Ansible, so if you use OpenStack from Ansible, you are using Shade. Uh, it's used in Infra's node pool. This is different than eBay's node pool. Uh, uh, just as Infra's Zool is different than Netflix's Zool, uh, we seem to have projects named the same thing as large uh, Bay Area companies. I'm not really sure what's up with that, but uh, it, is, it is used in Infra's node pool, uh, which is why I can uh, assert that it works at massive scale very well. Um, it, is, it is now its own uh, official OpenStack project. It was, uh, is always been working on, it's always been working on OpenStack because it was uh, birthed in the infra uh, team, uh, but we, we recently, this cycle, moved it into its own uh, uh, governance uh, entity, uh, which is why I, for, I forget to mention that I'm the, the, the PTL of it. I, I think of it still in my own brain as being uh, kind of a, a, a smaller part of a bigger effort, which in many ways it is. The infra cores still all have core on, on Shade, and we will, we will keep that. Um, uh, in terms of current status, we've been working on uh, converting uh, from using the Python, uh, the OpenStack Python libraries to using direct REST calls. Um, that's almost done. I will talk about that more in a little bit. Uh, so why? why? Why do we write Shade? <laughs> there are other libraries. Uh, why do we write another one? Um, so uh, uh, I, I dropped this uh, line in a talk at Tokyo, and I decided that I would just uh, reuse it and keep it here. Um, because we all love talking about branding uh, at tech conferences, um, uh, but it's, uh, it's the, the idea that, that we, we, everybody likes to go be unique, um, but actually the profit really comes from things being consistent. So uh, I want to use lots of different OpenStack clouds. I think that's the value of OpenStack, um, and I want to be able to use them uh, uh, the same. So unfortunately for all of us, and there's historical reasons for this, which if you find me in a bar, uh, I will, you, it will be very difficult for you to prevent me from telling you historical stories about uh, how, how all these things came uh, into account. I am 
in many ways, the old grandpa of OpenStack, uh, sitting around by the fire telling you know, yarns of back in the day. Uh, but so we leak abstraction layers. There's things that we expose that are, uh, that, that you have to know something about the deployment, and that's a bit bad. We also break APIs from time to time. We're getting better about this. We're getting better about versioning this. I think the micro versions work that uh, the projects are rolling out is actually fantastic. Uh, I promised uh, some folks that I would write a blog post about exactly why I think it's so fantastic back in Atlanta, and I have uh, written exactly none of that blog post yet, so uh, just suffice it to say, I think there's a lot of progress being made there. Um, there are some basic concepts that are needlessly complex. Uh, Clark Boylan has a, a session later this afternoon in the forum about, uh, about some of this. Um, he, he and I uh, can uh, trade off for each other in terms of complaining about this particular topic, uh, so that'll be a fun session. Um, the, the client libraries, one of the things that's become really clear to me from this work is that they, they look like they're, they're things that were written for you to use. Uh, they are not. Uh, they are very clearly written with uh, uh, the primary purpose of the services talking to each other. Um, uh, it, and they're, they're, they're reasonably good at that, but the, the, the design assumptions made in them is, is very tied to Nova talking to Glance, not me talking to Glance. Um, uh, and they work pretty, pretty well for that. Um, so uh, it, in our world in infra, um, uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm stretching this a little bit, but we, we run across a lot of clouds um, and at pretty massive scale. We spin up and tear down around 20,000 servers a day um, in, in service of the OpenStack uh, development effort. Uh, and it, it turns out that uh, uh, that takes a lot of effort. <laughs> we learned some things about using the OpenStack APIs. Uh, we thought that maybe sharing that uh, with the rest of the world and not just keeping it to ourselves on our node pool project uh, would be a nice thing. Uh, also, I started hacking on the OpenStack support for Ansible, and uh, I, I was like, wow, I'm just re-implementing all of this logic that we have in node pool. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, other people should be able to use that. So this is a very simple example of, uh, of using Shade. This is creating uh, this is uploading an image uh, to Vexhost uh, and then booting a server on it with a public IP and waiting for it to be done. Um, that's it. That does all of the things. Um, uh, and that, that works. I'm not going to run that for you because uh, uploading an image to a public cloud over conference Wi-Fi is... Uh, really a terrible idea. <laughs> um, no matter how good the conference Wi-Fi is or the cloud, uh, that's not going to be very enjoyable for everybody to watch. Um, but, uh, but suffice it to say that, that that script, if you have a Vexos account, uh, should work just fine for you. Um, we said this originally. We said that the existence of Shade is a, is a bug. Um, and it's a little bit of a flippant way, uh, I think, to, to, to say that it would be really great if the problems that Shade was working around in the OpenStack APIs were fixed, right? And I still agree with that. Uh, I still think we're going to. We've got several sessions this week where we're, where we're talking with deployers and other people about what are some solutions that we can, we can do to move the state of the art forward. Um, uh, but I, I actually think that we've, we've changed our mind over the last couple of years a little bit. Um, it, it may be that we have some issues with the APIs, but um, if we can provide our, our users with a way to, uh, to consume things, then great, right? Like that's uh, that's at least a step, and then maybe over time we can get to the point where, uh, where, where Shade doesn't have a bunch of logic in it that other things don't also have, because we've added discoverability features to, to OpenStack. We've, we've made sure that we're exposing the thing so that, that you know, other language ecosystems and, and other libraries can, can we, we can all share the same definition of what right is, uh, and it's, it's clear and concise. That's, that's the effort of like that's the effort of a lifetime. We're going to be working on that for forever, right? Um, but we can definitely get different, or excuse me, we can definitely get better at it. Um, and in the meantime, we don't have to sit around waiting for all of that work to be done. Uh, we can we can move things forward. We can we can provide some help to people today. Um, and uh, and if that works for you, great. And if it doesn't, um, you know, great too. Like it doesn't uh, subsume any of the other any of the other work. So. Uh, so you've decided that that sounds great to you and you would like to use this. Neat. Uh, so step one uh, in using anything is, uh, is configuration. Um, I, I'm personally a fan of things that require no configuration. 
Uh, and if you have to have some configuration, I prefer minimal configuration that a user has to do. Uh, it turns out it's impossible to, uh, to, to have no configuration because at some point you've got a username and password. Uh, so you're going you're gonna to have to, there's a, there is a, there's a bare minimum and a, and a URL. What's the, what's the auth URL for your cloud? Um, so, uh, but there's a whole bunch of other things that you, you might need to express about your cloud. Uh, so we've got a project called OS Client Config. It's actually uh, part of the, uh, God, Dean, what's the name of the, is it just the client? Per, what's the, the project name? It's yeah, it's part of the OpenStack client uh, uh, project. So the, the Python OpenStack client, the command line client, uh, is, the, is the, the governance home of the OS Client Config uh, project as well. Um, uh, it's a library to handle configura information, uh, config information for OpenStack clients. Um, uh, amongst the things that it does, it also tracks differences uh, in vendor deployments. These are mostly uh, public cloud uh, vendor deployments. Uh, I, it's kind of weird to put information into uh, a public Git repository about somebody's private uh, cloud deployment. Um, we have some thoughts on, on how, to, how, to, how to improve that in the future. Uh, but so it keeps a bunch of defaults uh, in tree uh, about things that we've discovered. Um, it's uh, because Ansible uses shade, OS Client Config is used in Shade. Also, Python OpenStack Client, as you might imagine, with it being in the Python OpenStack Client uh, governance project, uh, uses it, uh, as does the, the Python OpenStack SDK, um, and, and some other things. Uh, those, are, those are some of the main ones. Uh, it, uh, it reads a, clouds, uh, a config file called clouds.yaml. Uh, it also can process environment variables and arg parse arguments, uh, should you wish it to do so. Um, here is an example, um, uh, clouds.yaml file. This is uh, uh, for my CityCloud account. Uh, CityCloud is a lovely public cloud uh, running OpenStack that is based out of Sweden. Um, uh, you should check them out, they're great. Uh, my password, for what it's worth, is not a bunch of Xs. Uh, that, is, that is redacted. Um, but essentially here I'm, I'm naming a cloud, uh, my CityCloud, so that I can refer to it by name in, in other places. Uh, it, it is referring to a known profile of a vendor uh, and that, that vendor is named CityCloud. Uh, in my actual clouds.yaml file, I've named this CityCloud, and it uses the profile CityCloud, but that's pretty bad for a, for a demo and, and is confusing, so um, I renamed it for the purpose of the slide. Um, uh, but so this is basically saying this uses the settings in the, that we know of for the CityCloud vendor. Uh, so there's some defaults there, like what's the auth URL for for CityCloud, um, turns out it's the same no matter who you are, uh, so so you can just refer to them by name. Um, and then here's the actual uh, the actual authentication information. Uh, it's worth pointing out. Uh, actually, I think I pointed out on a later slide, so I will not point it out now. Um, here's a slightly more complicated one. I added some settings here that are not needed for Vexhost, uh, but just to show them. Uh, Vexhost is a wonderful cloud uh, run by Mohammed in uh, out of out of Montreal. Um, uh, in this one, I, I'm, I'm saying uh, this uses the vendor profile for Vexhost. Um, uh, I'm listing uh, the regions in here, just so you can see that you can, you can list which regions are available, which also means you can restrict which re regions are available to you if you want some validation. It's not really a, a, a big uh, win in doing that, um, but you can. Uh, and I've overridden a couple of things. I've told it that I want to use version three of the volume API. Um, and that I would like to use that endpoint for images. You do not need to do either of those things on, on, on Vexhost, but they are, they are things that you can express, and this is how you would express them in your clouds.yaml file so that uh, other things just work and, and do what you want them to do. Um, here is an even more complex uh, uh, set of things that you can do, and you know, hopefully you don't have to do all of these things. Uh, InternApp um, uh, also runs public cloud. Uh, I, they have a vendor profile, but I did not use that vendor profile in this, just to, to show you that you do not have to use pre-existing vendors. It's, uh, it's merely a convenience thing. So in this one, I have listed um, uh, InterNAP's uh, auth URL directly in my, in my config file, um, and I've got my, uh, my auth information in there. Uh, I've also told it that I, I would prefer to use version three of the Identity API, uh, which is a bit weird because I don't have any domain information in my authentication, so that's not gonna do exactly what I think it's gonna do, but, um, but I can express that. I've also told it that this cloud does not have floating IPs. Shade will figure out whether you, a cloud has floating IPs and whether or not you need a floating IP for you, um, but that does involve making uh, several uh, inquisitive calls to the Neutron API to, to sort of figure out what's going on. Um, uh, if you know that the cloud doesn't have 
that, then you can say, nope, please, uh, this one doesn't have that. Please skip all of those, uh, those attempts to investigate um, uh, whether or not uh, floating IP support is here. Um, and then those, those calls will get skipped. Um, InterNAP does an interesting thing. Uh, when you create a, a, an account uh, and, and get enabled in a region there, uh, they create you your very own public and private network. Um, because of some things about uh, Neutron, it is impossible for you as a user without pre-existing knowledge to tell purely from the Neutron API which of these networks is the public network and which of these networks is the private network. As a human, I can tell that because one of them says WAN in the name and one of them says LAN. So as a, as a human, it's, it's not particularly confusing. Um, but as, from a general API consumption, if I want to tell the API, please boot me a server on the public network, um, it is impossible to know that. Uh, uh, it, for what it's worth, there is, a, there is a flag on Neutron Networks called router external. Um, you might think that that communicates to you that this uh, that this network routes packets externally. That's not what that flag does. <laughs> um, that flag tells you you can attach a Neutron router to it and fetch floating IPs from it. It also incidentally uh, implies public. Um, so when I, when I asked Dim Gagne at Internap to please flip the router external true flag on my public network because that would allow me to discover that it was a public network, and he did that, all of the rest of the tenants at Internap saw, saw my my network, but I couldn't use it because it wasn't actually a shared network. Uh, so that, that broke some people when we reverted it really quickly. Uh, so I appreciate him uh, doing that and also that we all learned from that experience. Uh, so in this case, we've added the ability um, to the config to express some additional, uh, additional information um, that can't otherwise uh, be gleaned uh, just from API investigation. Uh, in this case, there's, uh, uh, there's a, a flag you can add um, that is routes externally. In this case, I have said that the WAN one routes externally is true, and the LAN one is routes externally equals false. In general, the intent behind that terminology is that uh, public and private are vague if you're in a private cloud scenario. So it's about does this route packets off of this cloud, or are these does this route packets only within this cloud? And yes, there is a, a question. It is not. This is, this is additional information that you are supplementing to the information that, uh, that is going to be found from the API. Took something that was confusing and named it the same thing, but it's not the same. It's, uh, yeah, okay, fair. Uh, the the uh, router colon external is the, but you're right. That, that, is, a, that is a fair. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah, that's terrible. I'm a very bad person. Um, yeah, all right, well, I'll think about that for next time. Uh, I'll think about fixing that. Uh, anyway, um, we've also indicated here, uh, so those are both networks that are gonna show up in my network list in my, for my account, which means that if I want to boot a server, uh, in every case, um, uh, Nova is going to want me to tell it uh, which network I want to boot on. Um, uh, so that's cool, like if, if that works for your workflow, that's awesome. Uh, it's not hard to do that. Um, but in my case, I happen to know about my usage that I always want to, unless I say something else, uh, boot on, on that network. Um, so I have labeled it as the default uh, interface. And so if I, do not give, uh, if I do not give the shade create server call uh, a network list on this cloud, it will pick that network. Um, uh, and this also uh, points out that you can, any of the, any of the, auth, any of the settings uh, that, are, that are in the file, you can set on a per region basis uh, inside of the regions list. So I, I could also set those uh, globally, but that wouldn't make sense since each of those networks is only in the AMS01 region. Um, hopefully, in general, in the most cases, uh, you don't have to do things like that. Uh, also, uh, we will process environment variables that start with OS underscore. Um, we put them into a cloud named envvars. Uh, it is, in fact, possible to override the name of the cloud that it generates uh, for that, but uh, don't bother. Um, and just know that they're in a cloud called invars. Uh, we do not overlay them on top of other config because uh, in, in our very early days, we attempted that, and it, it, it confused all of us. Uh, no one could ever predict um, what the result would be 
uh, correctly, and, um, and, and weird, 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 weird bad things would happen. So uh, those go in there. Uh, so if you want to, in your life, use a combination of environment variables and, uh, and config file, uh, that, is, that is the method available to you. Um, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a thing that uh, has confused people, so I thought I'd, I'd call it out here real quick. Keystone has pluggable authentication. Uh, this may be a thing that people weren't aware of uh, because most of the clouds just use the normal password auth, um, but there are other ones like OIDC Connect and SAML and all sorts of other uh, great thing, mostly related to uh, 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 federation uh, types of things. Um, uh, if you don't set an auth type, it's going to default to password, which is going to do Keystone Auth's best to, uh, to auto-detect which backend it should use based on the parameters that you have provided in the auth dict. Um, the contents of the auth dict itself are essentially opaque. Uh, there's a, we, we're actually validating it probably more than we should, which is causing Dean no source of problems, and we are working on unwinding that so that uh, it happens later and, and when it should. Uh, so I, I apologize to everybody that that may have caused problems for. Um, but in general, it, this, this is, uh, the, the, the contents of that auth dict are completely dependent on, uh, on what uh, auth type you have. Um, uh, and it's just sort of a thing you have to know, and it's one of my issues with ACI, API usability we haven't fully solved yet, uh, because you have to have a priori knowledge of what uh, auth plugins your cloud uses um, so that you can connect to the cloud, um, which is a little bit chicken and egg problem. Uh, so, uh, yay, we'll talk about that later in the day, uh, some options to, to fix that. It is important pointing out that auth type is not a member of the auth dict. It may seem like a thing that should go into the dictionary called auth. It is not. Uh, it, is a, it is a global setting that tells you how to process the auth dict. Uh, so if that's confusing, uh, I am sorry, but that is the explanation and that is where it goes. Um, oftentimes if you can't connect and you're getting authentication problems, it is entirely probable that you either have the auth settings up one level or you have other settings that you thought you were using in the auth dict, uh, so be aware of that. Um, you can use this through Python OpenStack client, uh, the config stuff. Uh, so you can do OpenStack dash dash OS dash cloud equals my Vexos. That's the name that I had listed in the cloud or in the thing and servers list. Uh, or you can do the same thing by uh, using the OS cloud uh, environment variable. Um, there's two environment variables, OS cloud and OS region name that are selectors. They do not cause the creation of an invars uh, config entity. Um, uh, they, they help uh, select which of the existing uh, things you would like to use. Uh, so they may be useful to you if you're doing a bunch of uh, OpenStack client uh, commands after each other to just set uh, an environment variable to tell it which of the clouds you're, you're wanting to use uh, at the moment. Um, so that is, uh, that is available. Um, there's a command that shade ships called shade inventory. Uh, there's a, an, a dynamic Ansible OpenStack uh, inventory plugin that we ship with Ansible. Uh, that gives you a thing, and uh, the code implementing it is all in shade, actually. Uh, so we wrapped a really quick um, uh, uh, command line client around it, uh, basically just in case it's useful. Um, uh, uh, you, so you can use this to browse your, your things and, and see what it is. So this is, uh, uh, this is the, um, the, the list of servers that I have in, uh, so I think, so this is my, I think this is my IRC bouncer uh, that's right here. Um, and you can see a few of the things that we, that we do uh, in um, Shade's data normalization. Uh, one of them that's worth pointing out that I don't have a slide on anywhere else is we add this location stanza to basically every object that we return from Shade um, that lists the cloud and the project information um, uh, and any region and zone information that are associated with that thing. So that if you do something like, for instance, this inventory list, which is a single list of my servers across three different clouds in this particular case, uh, you can know in any one given point what what cloud or what region of that cloud or what project that that object came from. Um, it does make this a little bit more verbose as we have some nested objects in here like these security groups, which also you'll notice have locations in them uh, and in the list of security group rules uh, also have locations in them. But that's just, uh, that's just life. Uh, you're just gonna have a bunch of repeated location information um, and you, know, you can just ignore it uh, if it doesn't really work for you, that's fine. Um, 
but it's there. So, uh, so essentially, each OpenStack cloud object, which is the main object in, in OpenStack, uh, uh, represents a region of a cloud. Like that's the essential unit of operation. Um, uh, you can you can share authenticated HTTP sessions among services in a in a single region of a cloud. You you cannot do that uh, across regions uh, of a, of another cloud. A neat offshoot of thinking about that in that way is that a region. Um, uh, there isn't really much difference from a user perspective between uh, a two regions at City Cloud and a region at City Cloud and a region at Vexhost, right? They're just cloud regions, um, which is which is kind of neat. Um, it, it means that that you you ultimately can have uh, a, a cloud with 30 regions in it, um, uh, even if nobody is running one of them just by themselves. Uh, so it's kind of kind of cool. Um, I'm I'm pretty into that. Um, so this is the simplest way to get a cloud object. Uh, we have a helper method inside of the shade uh, package called OpenStack Cloud um, that'll do all the things that you need it to do. Um, uh, if you only have one cloud in your configuration, uh, this will work, right? This will do the right thing. It doesn't require you to specify which cloud you want. If it is obvious because you only have one, uh, that's fine. Um, uh, if you have more than one, but you use one of them a lot and you, you're tired and just like when you're trying to do a few things, uh, you want to do it, you can, there's a, you can add a section to clouds.yaml um, uh, that uh, sets uh, a default for cloud, um, uh, and that will cause this to pick the right one. Um, uh, simple cloud uh, uh, construction from uh, Shade's perspective, if you have more than one and you want to select them, you just tell it which one. So this is uh, selecting the Beijing region of United Stacks public cloud. Um, uh, which, by the way, is a, a, lovely, a lovely public cloud run in China, um, because it turns out we have public clouds all over the world, which is really cool, uh, and run by people in those locations, which is even cooler. Um, uh, you can get more complicated if you want to. So like, you, it's possible that, that you may want to use more configuration facilities for reasons. We do this in a couple places uh, ourselves. Um, so you don't have to use that helper factory function. If you don't use that helper factory function, it's a little bit more work to, to get things you know, up and going, which is why there's a helper factory function. Um, uh, but you can directly grab a config object from OS, uh, OS client config, you can manipulate it, and you can pass it directly to uh, Shade's constructor, and you'll be good to go. Uh, we use Python logging. It's a Python library, uh, so yay. Uh, we, we use the standard, uh, standard logging stuff. Uh, we have a helper, another helper function called simple logging. Um, since Shade is a library, uh, it would be very inappropriate for it to, in, uh, at constructor time, uh, uh, set up loggers and whatnot, since those are things that applications are supposed to do. Um, if you're setting up uh, logging in that way in uh, constructors of your libraries, please stop, uh, because it makes it harder for people who are using your libraries from their applications to set up the logging the way that they want in the application. Um, but that said, uh, setting up... Um, uh, setting up Python logging can be complicated and annoying um, if you basically just want some logging real quick. Um, so we made a, a, a helper function that applications can use, or scripts or whatever you're writing, uh, to just turn it on and set it up the things. One of the things that that function does is it turns off a bunch of annoying warnings uh, of, from some of the libraries that decide to warn you about things that you as a user cannot do anything about. Um, one of my personal philosophies that is shared by at least some of my colleagues uh, is that uh, warnings that are given to a user should be things that the user can do something about, not warnings uh, about things that are completely outside of the user's control and thus are just going to be warnings that are displayed every single time they do anything. Uh, those are useless warnings. And I am, in fact, looking at you, Python requests library, for warning me about the certi certifi certificate at Rackspace. The certificate at Rackspace is fine. Uh, the fact that it does not have a subject alt name, although that is a recommendation of people to put on it, is not anything I can do about. I can't fix it. I don't work at Rackspace. If I did, they wouldn't let me fix it. It's their certs, so don't show that warning. So we fix that for you. Um, uh, that goes away, and, and you will not get that warning if you're using Shade. Um, in fact, for that particular warning, we have a library called Requests Exceptions, um, uh, and you can use that library to turn off those annoying warnings from requests in your application should you be doing something else and they annoy you. Uh, it's, it has one function in it, which is turn off the warnings. Um, so, uh, yay. Um, anyway, that's me ranting about that topic. Uh, there's basically two options to the simple logging helper function. One of them is debug equal 
equals true, this does exactly what you think it would do. It turns on debug logging. Um, uh, I hope that's not shocking to anybody. Um, the thing that, that may be interesting to point out uh, about that is we have a separate logger uh, that we configure inside of Shade for logging information about request IDs. Um, uh, simple logging debug equals true also turns on that logger. Uh, that is separate so that if you're writing a larger application uh, and you want to log that separately, that type of image, or you, you want debug logging but you don't really, aren't really interested in, in OpenStack uh, REST request IDs, you can, you can squelch them or whatever. Um, but if you're just using a simple logging, you're gonna get those. Uh, HTTP debug equals true implies debug equals true. Uh, it will set it for you. There's no way to get HTTP debug, HTTP debug without debug. Um, uh, and it basically that just adds the, the request tracing at the HTTP level. So if you wanna see exactly what's going on uh, at the REST interface, it will set that up for you appropriately. Um, a quick note on exceptions. Uh, we haven't gotten rid of all of Python uh, client libraries inside of Shade yet. Uh, where we are still using them and raise exceptions, we, uh, we catch those exceptions and raise different ones. This is also an evil practice. Uh, I am a very bad person for having participated in it for a period of time, but we've known pretty much since the beginning that we were going to migrate off of the Python client libraries at some point. And since exceptions are part of a library's API, uh, I did not want people to start depending on a Nova client exception and then switch to using REST calls and then their applications be broken. So we chose to do the evil thing and wrap exceptions for a period of time. Uh, now in all the places where we're making direct REST calls, we are, th we are throwing the original exception correctly. Uh, so we are, we are, in addition to getting off those libraries, we are getting out of the wrapping exceptions game. We do include the wrapped exception in the exception that is wrapping it. There is a way to get the entire trace back so that you don't lose the context information. Um, uh, but uh, it is worth knowing uh, that about that. Um, uh, uh, also, other things there, we'll talk about that in restification. Uh, uh, the exception stack is very easy in Shade. Uh, there are all subclasses of OpenStack Cloud exception. Um, so catching that will catch pretty much anything other than Keystone auth authentication errors. Uh, we do admit that Keystone auth is part of our part of our key stack, and so its exceptions are are valid. We're not going to get rid of Keystone auth. Uh, it's it's part of the API um, because it processes the the auth plugins for us. So uh, so if we weren't admitting that that was how those were working, then everything would be horribly wrong. Um, our direct REST calls throw um, OpenStack Cloud HTTP error, which is a subclass of OpenStack Cloud exception. Um, uh, uh, it also subclasses requests exceptions HTTP error, so you can catch either one of them. Uh, uh, that was basically because we'd been throwing OpenStack Cloud exception the whole time, um, so we needed to uh, we needed to continue throwing that. Um, but there's some really good information inside of the requests exception stuff, um, and people know how to work with that exception. So you get both. Both things with all of our REST uh, things. Uh, we have two um, specific exceptions that uh, we, we haven't really expanded this past those two. They're just there for historical reasons. Um, uh, so a 404 will get you URI not found and 400 will get you bad request. Those are also just subclasses of HTTP error, so you can, which has status codes in it. So you can catch HTTP error and just deal with the status code, which is probably what you want most of the time. Um, uh, I wouldn't be, fully opposed to throwing more specific exceptions, but I also haven't found a specific use for it yet. Nobody's requested it, so, um, so that's just the, the thing with that stack. Um, so all of that, I said all those things, I'm gonna show you the basic example uh, again. Uh, so here's uh, uh, uploading to, to Vexos with uh, debug logging and creating a server. Um, so let's talk about some problems. Uh, that's a whole bunch of preamble. Um, uh, by the way, how am I doing on time, anybody? It ends at 12, I think. Seven minutes. <laughs> so, image API versions. One of my favorites, uh, depending on the cloud, you either need to use the v1 put interface to upload an image, the v2 put interface, uh, the v2 tasks interface, which involves uploading the image to Swift and then requesting that Glance import it from Swift. Uh, this is different than the v1 import from URL, which is not a feature in v2, um, and that uh, Shade does not expose because it is uh, not possible to expose it uh, for both, uh, both API uh, versions. Um, so um, as a user, you have to know those things. Um, it's uh, 
The way you discover that is by trial and error. Um, and so, uh, which is one of the reasons it's a piece of information that we include uh, in the vendor profiles of OS client config. Um, so here is some image upload code specifically. Uh, you've seen a chunk of this basically like in five slides now. So I'm apparently really into uploading images to Vexhost. Um, uh, but these two lines are the lines you need to upload images. This is what it will do. Um, so what it's going to do is first it's going to calculate some hashes for that image uh, because uploading images is a really long and expensive process and uh, we, we add some hash metadata on them so that we can detect whether when you ask us to upload this image if we have already uploaded that exact same image and it already exists so we can uh, appropriately know up. Um, uh, we then, uh, and so it, we got a, an MD5 and a SHA for that. Uh, it turns out you can get both from the same loop through the file so why not? Um, we then check to see if it's there, um, uh, which we do twice for some reason. Oh, sorry, I, I, this tripped me up yesterday. We, we make two calls because the Glance image API is uh, paginated. Um, so you have to make sure that you've got all of the images. Uh, then we, we, we post um, uh, the image uh, content. And, uh, and then we, excuse me, then we, we post the image metadata. So we create the image object. Uh, and then we put to the images file uh, 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 file endpoint uh, the actual data uh, of the image itself. Um, and you can see we've got the debug logging turned on, so we're seeing the request IDs uh, that were used in those calls. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. Like, that's not, that's not terrible. Uh, not terrible if that was what the interface was for everybody. Um, but it's possible that your cloud might implement the V2 tasks API, uh, like our fine friends uh, at Rackspace. Um, oh, and look at that, uh, there's, a, there's a span. So I was, I was trying to highlight, um, apparently I'm bad at HTML, uh, I was trying to highlight the, uh, the, the fact that VHD is the format um, there that is uh, amongst the problems. We talked with fine folks in the Glance Operator uh, session yesterday about the fact that it's not possible as a user really easily to know what image format you need to upload an image in when you're uploading an image. But anyway, this is essentially the exact same code, except with uh, cloud is Rackspace and region is DFW. Otherwise, it's, and it's got a span in the name of the file name. That's probably not the name of the file. Um, <laughs> but I don't know, maybe, maybe I got really clever. Uh, but it's, other than that, it's the same code. So this is what that does. Uh, we start off with the same thing. Uh, we, we calculate hashes uh, for, the, for the thing. Then we, um, we do some, uh, some API discovery, um, which you didn't see in the other one because I had that image, uh, uh, image endpoint uh, override in the, in the Vexhost entry. Um, so we do, a, we do a discovery thing. Uh, Glance version discovery failed um, because Glance version discovery doesn't work at the Rackspace Cloud, so we have to fall back to the endpoint in the catalog. That's a whole other topic. Uh, then we, we get the images and we paginate uh, twice because there's a lot of images there. Uh, so we check to see if we've got the image that we're about to upload. Um, uh, then we... Um, uh, then we go to the object store because this is a, a, a task thing. So we, we do some things. We, we check uh, a container. Um, we, we create the, we make sure the container's there. We push an object into, uh, into the images container. Um, uh, this, uh, this bit right here where we're putting um, uh, to the object store, if the image is big enough, which it was not when I created this uh, example log output because I didn't want to wait for an hour for a very large image to upload, uh, we, we do actually run that in, in multiple threads in the background so it splits it out because you're actually uploading it in, in, in large object chunks. <laughs> Uh, so that also happens transparently for you. Uh, you don't have to know anything about that, especially not if you're, uh, if you're just wanting to upload an image. Uh, you do not have to know about chunked large object uploads in Swift. Um, uh, and then we do the, uh, the, the final tasks. Uh, we, we create the task and we, we track the task and, um, and then the task is done and then we have an image, which is very exciting. Uh, so I mentioned version discovery in that. Um, all the OpenStack services have this great version discovery uh, endpoint that returns version discovery documents. Um, except the thing that we put into the service catalog is the versioned endpoint, uh, which is not the endpoint that carries the information, the, the really lovely version discovery uh, document. Um, which means that although version discovery is a concept in OpenStack, it is not very well uh, accessible to anybody consuming the REST API. Actually, um, because you wind up having to do URL uh, uh, manipulation to find the actual API or the actual endpoint 
um, which, is, which is kind of bad. In addition to that, some of the services, for historical reasons, uh, have, have, have uh, promulgated an idea of version service types onto the world because, because we'd been sticking versioned endpoints into the catalog and version discovery wasn't available, then how can you roll out a new version while the old version is still there, even though there was a mechanism for that to exist, uh, we just started adding new entries to the service catalog. Um, so uh, uh, from a user's perspective where what you want to say is, please use version two of the volume service, uh, it gets really complicated depending on what the version is. Uh, and this actually is just a general problem, not really a deployer specific problem. Um, so we work around this in shade for Glance and Sender today because we have to. Uh, it is not possible to not work around it. Um, uh, we've been working on some documents uh, to document the process for doing this completely uh, uh, they're long and evil to read, um, so I don't recommend reading them, but we've got some, uh, some plans to uh, document that and um, uh, get people onto the OpenStack service types authority so that there's consistent names that people can count on and getting the other languages to implement version discovery correctly so that we can then start to talk about changing how people register things with the catalog. It's probably gonna be a couple year uh, process, but uh, we, are, we are trying to work on that as a solution for not just shade. Uh, it may take a little while. Uh, we will be discussing uh, steps for that in room 102 at 440 later today, uh, if you'd like to talk about that and, and other sorts of things. Um, but ultimately, we'd like for users to be able to do things like say, I want version two of the image API, or I'd like the latest workflow endpoint, or I just like the compute endpoint and I don't care what version, so give me whatever you think is the right one. Uh, or I'd like either versions two or three of the volume uh, service. Uh, either one of them is fine for me. So networking choices are also fun. Your clouds can provide you externally routable IPs directly attached from Neutron, like OVH does. Uh, your cloud can do that and also support optional private tenant networks, like Vexos does. Uh, your cloud can have private tenant networks provided by Neutron and require you to use a floating IP to get public IPs like CityCloud does. You can have private tenant networks provided by Nova Network uh, and require floating IPs uh, for external routing like Auro does. Uh, and your cloud can have externally routable IPs from Neutron, but non, no working Neutron uh, like, uh, like Rackspace does. Um, so uh, there's a couple different cases. Uh, this is an example of creating a server um, uh, on CityCloud, which is a floating IP required cloud. Uh, you'll notice that there is a flag auto IP equals true. This says, please do what you can to get me uh, an externally routable IP, however that works on this cloud. Um, and uh, I am running out of time, so I won't completely narrate this log, uh, but you might can tell that it does a lot of API calls to accomplish that task. Um, if we look at instead uh, InterNAP, uh, which gives you directly attached uh, uh, IPs when you request them, um, uh, and look at the log, it is uh, quite a bit shorter um, because you don't have to do all of those additional calls, but the shade API for that is the same. Uh, so um, that's probably pretty clear. There's another problem here. Um, how do you find the image you want to boot? Because uh, those are all deployed. These are, these are the names uh, of the, the latest Ubuntu Xenial image on uh, Vexhost, City Cloud, and InterNAP. Um, as a human, that's really easy to deal with. As a computer, not so much. Um, there's not a good solution for that, I'm sorry. I, I can't solve that for you today. Uh, we had some conversations about it in the, in the Glance Deployer uh, uh, session yesterday. Um, uh, there's an action item to take to actually collect everybody's user stories because we're pretty sure that everybody has an idea of a subset of what people are doing in this particular case. Uh, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to get to the point where we can define some, some common metadata that we expect deployers to put into the images they put into their cloud. Um, my solution for this today is always upload your own images. Um, it is the only way that you can be sure that you know what the image that you want to use is called on all of the clouds um, and that you know what content it has in it. Um, uh, we'll also hopefully uh, uh, implement a correct uh, life cycle. Um, there's also this crazy dependencies problem. The, the CentOS folks came up to me and complained about this uh, and I think a couple other people came up to me and complained about this uh, and, and then more people came up and complained about this. Um, the, the, the transitive dependency stack that comes with depending on a large set of Python uh, star client um, is, is pretty intense and insane. Um, and it, it causes packaging problems for people because you should basically always use the latest shade. Uh, it is 
it works with the old clouds as well as the new clouds. And we learn new things about old clouds that, that we take advantage of in Shade. So you shouldn't use, you shouldn't think to yourself, I'm running a Mataka cloud, I should use the version of Shade from Mataka to talk to my Mataka cloud. You should think I should use the latest version. Except if you've deployed a Mataka cloud and you're in that environment, then the fact that Shade pulls in a bunch of Python client libraries, which are also included in Mataka, means that you've got a really weird dependency hell that you've just stepped into. So this is amongst the reasons that we're undergoing the restification process uh, that I mentioned, um, uh, which I mentioned we've been hard at work at. We were done with Heat, Magnum, Swift, Glance, and Trove. Uh, Cinder and Neutron are basically done. Uh, we just landed the final patch for Neutron yesterday. Uh, the Cinder, I believe the next Cinder patch is just remove Cinder client from the dependencies list. Um, uh, that leaves us with uh, Nova, Ironic, and Designate left to do. Uh, and big shout out to both Rosario and Slawek who showed up after I sent out a call to the, a to the mailing list saying, we could use some more help on this task. Uh, they showed up and did a bunch of really great job. By the way, the code is much easier. Uh, with REST, the just so much easier, and I discovered that the REST APIs are actually way better than my impression of them was from having them exposed to me through the Python client libraries. Uh, so it turns out they're actually not evil to work with um, if you work with them. Um, so I can't recommend that highly enough. Uh, advanced things, and as usual, I'm way over time, uh, so I will, I will fly through these. Uh, Shade should do the right thing 95% of the time, but there are times when you need to be more advanced than that, uh, and we want to support that too. We just sort of made, want to make sure that the normal users don't have to, to interact with that kind of construct. Um, so we have this thing inside called uh, Task Manager, which came out of uh, Node Pool originally, um, and this uh, encapsulates every API operation that we do inside of a task that's run by a task manager. In the normal thing in Shade, when you get a Shade cloud, it, it just runs it. Like, there's a, there's a pass-through task manager, so the fact that it's running in a task manager is completely transparent to you. You should never notice it. Um, but if you need to do crazy things like Node Pool, uh, Node Pool passes in a custom threaded task manager that implements uh, API throttling and rate limiting. Um, uh, amongst other things. Uh, and that's essential to Node Pool's ability to do the amount of API calls that it does um, uh, uh, at the scale that it does. Um, so that's a, that's a thing you can look into if you have to do really crazy stuff, uh, especially if you're doing higher scale things. Um, uh, our get call, all of our, our resources have a list, a get, a create, an update, a delete. Um, get is a wrapper around list, and we do client side filtering. There are times when we can push filter conditions down to the cloud, and we do that in some places, uh, but, but we actually do, uh, it's mostly list and client-side uh, caching. Um, and we originally did this in support of scaling, which may sound weird, um, but when you have 100 threads creating uh, servers on, um, on a cloud and you're wanting to test their status, uh, listing the list of them and checking the status that way rather than doing 100 get calls um, is, uh, I promise you, uh, kills the cloud way less. Uh, we have also taken down public clouds um, from uh, similar things. So, um, so there's both concepts of caching and rate limiting. Uh, this needs to, there's, this is done in two different ways inside of Shade, and once we're done with restification, we can go to some consolidation of the approach there. Uh, but you can put in some caching config into your clouds.yaml file uh, and express some expiration times on a per resource basis. Um, I wouldn't recommend diving into that very deeply right now, um, uh, largely because uh, three of them, uh, servers, ports, and floating IPs, um, are special cased. Um, uh, we, we tried to unspecial case them and got it wrong and had to revert that, uh, so we will try again uh, to unspecial case them and to make sure that we can get it right. Luckily, we have, uh, <laughs> Luckily, the node pool will tell us immediately if we get it wrong, um, so it's, it's not really a, you know, it's not a problem with testing uh, that, uh, so we'll work on that next. Um, if you're not a Python developer, uh, we do love you. Uh, you can use Ansible, it's the same stuff. Uh, it uses the same thing, so you can just make simple calls like that. Um, and as a final thing, uh, just to continue to point, uh, push home my point about multiple clouds that all look like a thing, this is a working uh, Ansible task that will upload my key pair um, to uh, uh, 30 regions across 13 clouds. Um, and that's all of the ones that it is, and I, probably, I could probably implement the Ansible in a more clever way that didn't just involve listing them all, um, but the fact that that's run by a, you know, 13 different providers uh, doesn't prevent me from using that as one really big public cloud. Uh, so basically, if you keep trying to tell me that open 
but cloud isn't a thing, I'm gonna keep telling you you're wrong. Um, so anyway, uh, that's, my, that's my thing there. Uh, we are trying to push all of this back into OpenStack APIs as we can. Um, so there's a bunch of discussions later on today on service discovery, version discovery, all this. Clark's got a thing on user API improvements. Uh, we're working up documents with the API working group. Uh, so this is, this gets you out, this work, should work for you today, um, but we don't want to rest our laurels on that. Uh, we want to make the, the situation better for, for everybody. Uh, and I'd ask if you have questions, but I'm probably 20 minutes over time, so uh, I'm going to stop talking now. Thank you very much for listening to me ramble.